In the last episode, we talked about borrowing capacities, five tips specifically to actually increase that. And that was a special message delivered to us from Lee at Hills Finance. Now, we transition deeper into the world of borrowing capacities, navigating through the current finance environments, and actually bring on another special guest to be able to come on and share his experience. So in today's episode, I'm joined by Brian, and Brian actually is from uh, homeequities.com.au. So if that is a website you want to check out, it's homeequities.com.au. Now, Brian's specialization is really important to everyone listening here. It's complex deals, it's investment portfolios, and it's actually working with buyer's agent clients. Very unique, right? Because many brokers will look after all sorts of deals, but very few brokerages will go, no, no, we're specialists for buyer's agent clients. Why is that important? Because they understand the concept of team, they understand the concept of synergy, and getting you results with the right synergy with those investing partners. Now, what Brian really talks about in this episode is about some tips, tools, technology that they use, and how he's brought his experience from back in Macquarie Banking to now even in this brokerage home equities and be able to deliver well over eight years of experience and then even more if you take it to his home of Ireland before he came to Australia. This is where you're going to get some value on some of the things he's seeing, especially as interest rates go up and how his clients are navigating and planning ahead of time to be able to purchase properties with the right support. I'm Arjun, Head of Research at Investigate Buyers Agency, and this is another episode of the Investigate Podcast. Brian, thank you for joining, mate, the Investigate Podcast. Uh, I've been keen to tee up this chat with you, and I guess just to give the, the listeners and viewers a little bit more about yourself, what got you doing what you do today? as well as the company. I'd love to hear it from you, mate. Yeah, great. Um, listen, thanks very much, firstly, for having me. Um, really appreciate it. So it uh, probably won't take your listeners too long to figure out that I'm Irish. So I'm from the west of Ireland and I uh, arrived in Australia at the start of 2009. Um, and I started working actually with Macquarie Bank way back then and in the home loan section. So I spent, I think it was about four to five years um, with Macquarie Bank in a lending capacity customer service um, aspect. And in that role in particular, um, I started to one, get a lot of product knowledge, but also um, see where certain things were going wrong for customers. And uh, I just sort of spotted a little bit of a niche in the market and it may not necessarily be um, a niche that you would look at from a perspective, but um, into what I mean by that is that um, a direct niche, but it was just a lacking in, I suppose, a sort of service component in the industry. And I just felt like that there was only need to capture a small percentage of that uh, market to actually do do well. So that's where I decided to take the step out. Uh, I think we were operating there for just a little over eight years. Um, and yeah, we built our business up from me flying solo to we've got about a team of 10 or 11 at the moment so yeah here we are today so we're based in Balmain in, in Sydney and uh, we do a lot with investors which which I know you're very interested in your side of the side of the fence so yeah that's that's where we come from yeah so I think on that note what I think of just when you come in from Ireland to Australia there's two things that in my mind one was the timing 2008, 2009. So for the investor folk, you know, people who've watched movies, the big short, the GFC. Yeah. And then the first thing you do is, hmm, might could grab a job at a bank, right? So yeah. how, how did that all yeah. line up for you? Because obviously that was an interesting time for banks in the, in the mainstream side of things. It, it was actually. And the funny thing was, I saw um, Ireland was very much hit in the, the GFC back in 2008. And I was working in banking in, in Ireland as well before I came, came to Australia. And the, I distinctly remember the day where there was a queue of people out the door of the bank looking to come in and actually draw out their, their funds on, on that day. And it was a, look, it was a sad day, you know, because yeah. it was obviously, it was the beginning of a, a pretty hard, hard time for the, for the country. And yeah, I suppose it was the timing, look, not to say it was, it was ideal because it, it wasn't and coming to Australia to get a job in the bank, it was most definitely not an easy thing to do. 
um, took a lot of persistence, a lot of knocking on doors and coming from a banking experience, I thought, well, at least, you know, I should be able to come into the banking industry relatively easy. It just wasn't the case. So I did it took a lot of knocking on a lot of doors, um, a lot of interviews with with um, banks, recruiters and everything like that before I actually managed to get the foot in the door. But yeah, look, the rest is history. Yeah, man, that's definitely a challenging time for many. And I think some flavors exist today in terms of the challenges people face, but that's why people have you know, professionals like yourself on their corner. I mean, this is a good segue into the real core parts of why me and you are chatting today. Number one, there's many brokers out there, but very few are true investment specialists. And that's a big part of building wealth because we know the finance comes first, the property comes second, and far too many brokers are transactional or ABC. And by that, I mean checklist, right? Versus someone who thinks like an investor. And then the second and third parts is you're a good dude. And then the final part is when it comes to you know your understanding of building a team, you don't think of just the investing side of things from a finance, but you, your business operates uniquely where you do a lot of collaboration with the world of buyers agents. So I guess on that note, could you maybe talk to me about why a collaboration from a buyer's agent to mortgage broker is a bit of a match made in heaven? And most importantly, how your customers get ahead with your team structure in this way? A uh, very good question. Look, one of the things that I talk a lot about, and you asked me about how I got into the investment space, so maybe just touch on that. And I, I think it's probably just a passion for it as well. So um, a lot of these say mortgage brokers, they can do a lot of either homeowners or first home buyers and what, what have you in terms of the refinance game. So there's various different um, aspects of mortgage broking. But for me, uh, the love of the investment space really was where I just looked at that. And that was really what I was interested in. And I guess the benefits of what the property has to offer people from a financial aspect. And I really liked seeing that and seeing it actually come to life when when customers would come back a couple of years later and we've done valuations on the property and they've gone up, you know, 80, 100 grand in such a short period of time. And, um, you know, that was a, a real feel good factor for, for, well, I guess for me, but also the customer was was starting to reap the, the rewards for taking that risk and doing what it was that they did. And I suppose, like you mentioned, that match made in heaven, like we can't be a jack of all trades. So, you know, our specialty is the finance and it's helping customers build that investment portfolio with the financing aspect, because there's ultimately periods where customers start to tap out on borrowing capacities and understanding the bigger picture rather than that one investment property. It's like, is it a goal or you know objective to build that investment portfolio because that's going to ultimately lead to the initial strategy and how we start off the lending aspect rather than you know let's call it the the best interest rate in the market because if the goal is the bigger investment portfolio we got to consider all of that and as i said we're not a jack of all trades we specialize in that section of the market and the buyer's agent is a is a key component to that strategy and customers and you know I talk again to customers about this a lot is that the property market it's it's a very sophisticated thing now okay it's it's uh, to get it right you need to have experts in the in the field it's it's gone to the point now where you you have to have the right team in place and having a quality buyers, agents like yourselves involved in the transaction is where customers will ultimately reap the rewards out of it. So, you know, we see the pitfalls in the background. We know where the things can come unstuck. And by having that strong collaboration between a broker, a buyer's agent, a solicitor, we can work at that solution out for the customer. And often they don't even need to know about it. We just fix it and get it done. And, and it happens. That's a really good point because it's almost like, you know, that's the power of the team. We keep talking about team and team and team, but what Absolutely. does it actually mean, right? Like that's the power of it. On that note of the team, if you imagine your experiences, because this is obviously a path that you, you had the investing experience, but then other professionals came into the mix like buyers, agents and things. But then if you look at your experience as say a story where you have a customer, no buyers, agent involvement, and then a customer, buyers, agent, mortgage broker, everyone coming together, What's an example of like 
the pitfalls someone has on this side versus the gains they've had on the other side, just for me to better understand where you feel like that match really comes to life. Yeah, sure. Uh, look, a specific example would be one who bought a an apartment. So they they took it upon themselves where they wanted to, to go the journey alone. And this, I suppose, was a learning experience from my side as well, because um, you know, now we deal directly with buyers, agents, or customers that come to us must have that buyer's agent relationship to 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 work with us. But they went on that journey on their own at the time and purchasing that apartment that they bought as it came to light that uh, once the bank valuation was done, there was certain cladding that was all over the, the property that didn't meet code. And there was a scramble to try and figure out how that was all going to go and how that actually was going to come to get that approved. And the bank weren't happy with it um, because they couldn't produce the documentation to actually get the clearance on that on that cladding. And, you know, the customer is at risk of losing money, a highly stressful situation, cooling off periods in the in play. Um, stressed out solicitors like there was a lot of people getting involved with all trying to sort that situation out whereas you know it's it's just your due diligence you know the, with the level of expertise that a buyer's agent brings to the market is that they see these things because these are just things that people in your field see every day and know these are going to cause issues or you bring it to the broker's attention and you say, well, can we check this out first? Is this going to be a challenge with the bank rather than producing just a contract and saying, hey, I'm after buying this and we go down the track of getting formal approval and it all comes undone at the last minute. So not a great experience for the customer. Um, the, as I said, everyone involved, highly stressed, highly emotional to, to, to get that through. And yeah, look, as I said, it's just not one of the ones that you want to be kind of dealing with on a, on a regular basis from, from a buyer's perspective in particular, because, you know, that's, that's just not, not what, you, what you want to get. Versus your, your buyer's agent's opportunity where, uh, let's just call that stress-free, okay? Mm -hmm. Because someone who's using a buyer's agent puts that full trust and faith into the, that team where you typically will look at what the numbers really are going to do for the customer what the property is going to do you've done the research on the area you've done the research on the property the due diligence is, is all completed and it's essentially vetted before it even gets to the customer where you can then say hey these are the things that might come up and we identify them and they're already either covered off or non-existent because the due diligence is actually done. And realistically, the customer ends up just signing there. The tenants are already brought into the property. There's no issues with the bank and everything just works nice and smoothly. And then you do a valuation two years later and they're 150, 200 grand in the positive on the back of that because they've taken the advice. It's been a seamless process for them. And... They, they really have very little to do other than when it comes to signing the dotted line and away you go. Yeah, what I sense the most there is almost, it's not about doing the loan for you. It's about doing the loan, knowing that customers are going to have success on the other side. And then you find partnerships to be able to enhance that success so you can feel not only good about, hey, cool, we got this across and the deal's done, but also about you're going in the direction you want to go, Mr. and Mrs. Customer. So that's very fulfilling, both from a, you know, a satisfaction of looking after that person well at the time, but also linking up with them yearly, two times a, uh, every two years, every three years. The story just keeps getting better. So now that last couple of years and looking at where we are today, the beauty of, I guess, your experience in both role and also banking before that is you've seen different interest rate periods. You've seen different borrowing capacity policies. You've seen people cut stuff at APRA. You've seen them remove stuff. You've seen them bring things back. So I guess we're in this interesting time now where the changing environment of finance is changing super fast. Now, I know it's always changing, but we're talking month on month on month, that to nine months in a row now of interest rate rises. And there are many consumers who are looking at this finance change in landscape and saying, I don't know what to do. My numbers are changing every month. And they feel a bit confused and lost. And if that doesn't you know, prove it, the sales volumes does because sales volumes are heavily declined. And so that means that there is a lot of transactions no longer there that was there when capacities and sentiment and improvement was there. So I guess from your perspective, how do you best 
protect your customers from this, but what are some tangible tips where you go, hey, if buyers, you know, clients of ours do this, they will really get ahead or at least protect themselves in this changing environment. Yes, it's uh, actually a piece I'm working on at the moment um, in terms of doing that um, analysis around what it was, what it currently is and what it can potentially be. So we've got collated um, a lot of the data from a lot of the economists in terms of what their projections look like. Now, but we all know there's no crystal ball out there. We're trying to gauge and see where things where, where things may lie. But it's about looking at, okay, what's that worst case scenario possibly look like for the customer and having that foresight into where it is. And it all starts with that conversation around where are you at now? Okay, so what are you trying to achieve and where are you at now? Okay, so if they come um, with a buyer's agent, so they've already engaged a buyer's agent and they're already active in the market. Okay, so you could be reasonably comfortable that they're probably going to transact relatively soon if they've already been started that research process and what have you versus maybe a buyer that comes in off the street who, you know, they, they may transact in the next six months or not. Who, who, who knows? Um, so you you have to have that conversation with them from the start to see where they're at now um, to get a gauge on how quickly that's going to move. Because if you don't factor in that interest rate hike into their actual assessment and borrowing capacity, it's all going to become unstuck down the track. And again, customers don't always necessarily understand that. You know, as simple as it might be for you and me to, to grasp that concept, again, for, for a lot of customers, it just sometimes they kind of, they sometimes hear what they want to hear. I don't want to sound bad on that. Um, but at least when we have that conversation um, as industry professionals, it's, it's like, okay, so today this is where it is. Another rate rise is going to put them in this borrowing capacity and another rate rise is going to put them in this borrowing capacity. So depending on how quickly you can transact through that, and how what the vendor is looking to do, et cetera, et cetera, um, that's going to have that. So it's just having that foresight. You've got to be looking ahead all the time on this um, because otherwise it's going to become on stock. If I go in max borrowing capacity today and they buy in three months' time, that's all going to come on stock. Got to have mm. that foresight today. Yeah, it's a speed is key in this sort of environment because it actually when Absolutely. you look at the borrowing capacity – the borrowing capacity changes are deeper in decline than actual price changes, right? That's so right. So you're actually losing the more you wait when you think of Australia's core logic national house price, even though there is no national market, uh, 5.7, 5.8 decline, whereas borrowing capacities are faced a 30 plus percent decline. That's it. The, the loser here is the borrower, unfortunately. So the amount of uh, borrowing capacity that has dropped out of the market for the borrowers is 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 far worse for the borrower than it is for the vendor at the moment. So if you you know my my conversation with the buyers is that if you're in the market and you're wanting to transact, you need to do it at a much more urgent speed rather than what it was. Because even though, and this I guess is a little bit of a misconception from the from the borrower's aspect, is that the price is going to come down. But the reality is, is that your borrowing capacity is going to come down and your purchasing power is going to be less. That property isn't coming down. It's just the pool is getting slightly smaller of buyers, but the property price isn't dropping at the same rate and level as what your borrowing capacity is. So there, you know, it's a little bit around educating them than, than sort of just throwing the figures at them and saying, away you go kind of thing. And on the flip side, buyers all want to get in back together at the same time. Isn't that interesting, right? <laughs> yeah. The common th thought here is that, well, if I wait till interest rates bottom out and change, we, we should be able to get a better deal. And I've been hearing the thoughts of quarter three, 2023 thrown around, quarter four. My thinking now is like it reminds me of this experience we've all had with March 2020, COVID hits. Yeah. Now, as per CoreLogic's data and review of domain and REA was very much similar, April and May of 2020 were the two deepest months of vendor discounting. After yeah. that, it was a V-shaped recovery every single month from there. So to be honest, you were only really that COVID buyer in April or May. After that, the trend was up. And if the trend was up, it means that you were just getting on the ride and hoping not to be the last one on the ride of that boom, right? So I don't think that's a smart strategy for many to play because they just risk being in competition for too many people 
if they come back when interest rates come back. That's it. That's it. like, and never a truer word said because I, I honestly feel like that as soon as it turns, it'll be flooded then, and then you're 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 out of the market then. You know, I, I say to people when they when they have that, they say, "Oh, it's not the bottom of the market." I ask them, "Well, can you come back to me when you find the bottom of the market?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> just just let me know. Just let yeah, me let's know. go halves. We'll go halves. Yeah, together. please. Yeah, please, please. Because that's exactly it. You know, there, there's a there's a lot of value out there in my view at the moment. A lot of value, um, and uh, look, I, I personally, I'm I'm renovating my own house at the moment, which is causing me a lot of heartache, and uh, you know, it's it's tying up a lot of what I my my borrowing capacities can be doing, and until I get that sorted and pushed out of the way, but the certain certain properties that I'm seeing coming across the desk now that I'm just going. That's a, that's a bargain. That is an absolute bargain, you know, so. Um, Definitely on the opportunity front, it exists, right? And, you know, you talked about speed and that was a big part of planning ahead, having professionals on your team. When it comes to cutting back deal processing time for a prospective client, that's also important because the, the thought time of inquiry with you versus when the deal actually is ready for them to go hunting and searching. Many people forget that it's not just all the broker. There's things a customer can do to say, let me actually shorten the time so I can get hunting and not be stuck in this interest rate environment. But also let me look at ways to work with my broker to actually increase borrowing capacity. Could you leave us with a few actionable tips on how a customer can work better with a broker from a deal processing time, but then also what they can work on with you to improve capacity? Yeah. You sure can. Number one tip is to stay away from the afterpay and the pay later schemes or what have you, because uh, a lot of people don't think that they get looked at by the bank, but they they actually do. Um, and they forget about it. And then it goes into the bank. If, if it doesn't get picked up and if it's in the transaction history somewhere, it can definitely slow that down. So that's number one. So Try as much as possible not to get involved with any afterpays or zip monies, things like that. Um, also as well, like embrace, we, we embrace technology and and we, we use a lot of that in terms of helping customers to make things that much faster, to help supporting documents, because a lot of the time it can be very cumbersome for that. So maybe a little bit of embracing some of that technology that people may not enjoy about the banking system to do that, because that also helps us do the analysis and helps it uh, uh, much, much quicker. So I always sort of step our customers tr through that because as I said, we've got certain tools that we can help people to gather that supporting documentation much, much quicker. One thing I always say is to people is just block a bit of time out of your day to do what it is, okay? Rather than doing it sporadically, because sporadically means that you end up hardly ever doing it because what happens then is you'll do it maybe on a Friday evening and then you'll forget about it for the weekend and then you'll come back at it on the Monday and it kind of comes in, let's say, the, the, any documentation that's required comes in dribs and drabs. I always say, take 30 minutes, okay? And whatever the documentation that's required, just sit down and just tick it off line by line and that's it done. And that's, that's about all as it would ever take. And that 30 minutes has probably been generous. I actually think that anything that we ask customers to do could probably be knocked over in 15 minutes. But the problem is, is that people look at it from just go, uh, I got that, I'll send that, I got that, I'll send that. You know, and they're just sort of things that can sometimes hold the whole process up. We get everything in one go, our processing team, we've got an SLA of a day in terms of getting things done. So my team will work on that. As soon as that documentation comes in and we have it fully there, we've got a day to get it actually submitted to the bank. So That's phenomenal. They're, the, they're, the, they're the things we look at. It's phenomenal in timing wise, but it also shows you that the difference is preparation versus just you know ticking little boxes as it comes because you're gonna get the results based on the time you put in. So if time and deal is, is so key, if I put in that time to work with you on that, that'd be that's going to make it easier. Now, speaking of all the tech stuff, I can't wait till the day comes where I could just speak to an Amazon or a or an Apple or an Echo, whatever you want to call it, and just go, "Hey, give Brian all the docs he needs," and yeah. just leave it at that, and then just <laughs> yeah. you take it all, right? I'm sure that's old not a bad chat, idea. <laughs> I'm sure old Chat GPT folks are hopefully tuning into the Investigate podcast and come up something yeah. crazy like is that simple. 
But uh, mate, yes. on the borrowing capacity front, I know Afterpay is the big one you talked about. Are there any other final tips you want to leave us with uh, in terms of borrowing capacity improvements? Um, look, the each each bank has got different lending assessment rates. Okay, so don't be pigeonholed into looking at that one lender. Okay, and I suppose that's I guess the beauty of with a broker. Okay, is that. Each bank has got those different um, assessments on how much they'll actually lend to you. And some of them have a much larger appetite for that investment property space as well. So don't pigeonhole yourself just because I may not know the, 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 the banner of the bank or who that is, is what I'm looking at. Because the, the borrowing capacity for you with bank A versus bank C maybe could vastly, vastly different. And the simple fact of the matter is, is that by actually opting to go with that lender versus just being pigeonholed into that one can greatly help you in terms of increasing that borrowing capacity. So I suppose that is the, that's the, the beauty about, or well, I say the beauty, but it's more around the, the, the art of what it is that we do is to actually help customers to actually achieve that. Look, you know, I could go into all the things, don't be spending too much money you know, don't be taking out unnecessary credit, like, you know, credit cards. Like if you have a credit card that you use, you know, the bank are going to look at that. So obviously reducing credit card limits and all that is something that can be done. But on a, on a broader scale, you know, the lenders out there have those other options is what I'm basically saying. And we'll work with you to help keep the, the, the credit facilities and the car loans and things like that, you know, debt consolidation is something that we need to do to look at increasing the borrowing capacity. That's all something that we can we can do um, to help you increase it. But reduce the credit facilities. Don't spend unnecessarily, and uh, and be open to the uh, lender options that are going to help you get to where it is that you need to go to. And and I think one thing that you know our team has shared in discussions with you is that your your team and from what we've learned is that. There's a lot of preparation too, meaning if your numbers aren't there today, it's like, what will it, what will you need to do to get the numbers there? What are the changes you need to make to get the numbers there? And that's the right team member to have. If your broker out there, if you're tuning into this is saying your borrowing capacity is X and that conversation ends, then that's where it usually ends as well for your investment portfolio scaling. That's where you have to have a chat like that and be able to say, well, where could it go if you did this? What could it do if you bought these type of rental returns? If with this bank, Absolutely. we give you this. And with another bank, we give you that. So, mate, thank you so much for all your tips and the insights um, you've given today. And, of course, uh, in this type of environment, the biggest takeout I'm hearing is speed is key. And that's one thing that you've uh, been able to implement in your business from turnaround times, implement in your business from industry relationships, and the technology that you give your clients too. So, well done. Hey, Arjun, I'll just leave you with one bonus tip on the borrowing capacities. High quality investment with great rental return most definitely help the customers on the borrowing capacities. So good yielding properties is always, always going to help a customer on their borrowing capacities and helping them get to that next level of uh, property investment portfolio growth. Awesome bonus tip made because so many uh, people out there will actually not ask the question or even talk about what rental yield they're going to get. And many brokers actually just say your borrowing capacity is that X number without actually giving them what yield they put in the system. And so you're having that open discussion and that's what creates that extra 100K, 50K or more. And so, mate, thanks for the bonus tip. I'm sure everyone will love that. No problem. Thanks very much, Arjun. Cheers.